I recently discovered a great book for myself and this will be the basis for a small video series. So this is now Chemistry with Radionuclides Part 1 – Vessels, Carriers and Precipitation. I already indicated in a short that quantities play a major role in chemistry, especially for the nuclear field because often work has to be carried out in a microscopic scale down to submicroscopic or even tracer quantities. This is also the reason why I rarely give yields in grams, because often it's neither weighable nor visible. Nuclear chemists often use the unit of quantity becquerel, decays per second. The weight can be calculated using the literature value of the specific activity, but these are sometimes nanograms or even less. Only few radioactive elements can be worked with in weighable quantities. These include technetium, thorium, productinium and uranium. So we have those elements right here. We are not allowed to handle transuranic elements, but we can still handle neptunium, plutonium up to californium. Here we have technetium-99 with a half-life of 210,000 years and around 2 grams of ammonium pertechnetate are dissolved in this flask. This is thorium nitrate. Thorium-232 has a half-life of 14 billion years. The amount seems to be around 10 grams or so. Productinium-231 is much more exotic and has a half-life of around 32,000 years and here we are talking about milligrams and even they are very scary. And then we have around 100 grams of uranium nitrate. The uranium-238 contained in it, which makes up 99.3% of the uranium contained in it, has a half-life of 4.4 billion years. Unfortunately, we do not have visible amounts of promethium-147 anymore. So now we're doing chemistry with thorium anyway. That's 0.2 milligrams of it here. Barely visible and now something special happens. Because such small amounts are quite unusual for chemistry. If we dissolve these 0.2 milligrams in 100 milliliters of water in a standard beaker with a capacity of 100 milliliters, all of the thorium is gone. Why? Because of glass. Let's reduce glass down to pure silicon dioxide. Yes, that would be quartz glass, but it doesn't matter here. At the phase boundary between the glass and the water, there are so-called silanol groups. These are slightly acidic and can dissociate in neutral water or alkaline environments and can now bind to cations via the now negatively charged oxygen ions. And this is how an ion exchanger works. And it's exactly the same thing happening here. Such a glass has an ion exchange capacity of 10 to the power of minus 10 moles per square centimeter. This means that the inside of the entire 100 milliliter beaker has a capacity of 10 to the power of minus 6 moles. 0.2 milligrams divided by 480 grams per mole equals 4 times 10 to the power of minus 7 moles. The ion exchange capacity of the glass is 10 times higher than the concentration of our thorium ions. Thorium is also an element that tends to form polysoluble oxide. It does this starting at pH of 5. This means that a large part of the thorium is already insoluble and the little that is still dissolved now sticks to the beaker. Why did I use thorium? Well, as a 4 plus ion, thorium is the radionuclide that exists in this form in aqueous solution and therefore has the highest charge density and this makes the glass cut ion exchange effect the highest. And how do we get around this? With plastic. Well, polymers can also have atoms with free electron pairs that adsorb radionuclides and the sad thing here is it gets worse for thorium. But only for thorium in this case. And now what? You use Teflon. Even if Teflon or better known as polytetrafluoroethylene is almost completely covered with free electron pairs. These belong to the fluorine. They won't be able in assisting the absorbance of any cation. You actually try to avoid transferring chemicals, but if, then look at how glass, plastic and Teflon behave. Teflon is much more hydrophobic and so losses are minimized. So glass is out and this is also a reason why I prefer to work in centrifuge tubes rather than test tubes. And I have to centrifuge a bit more often than other people. Highly active, i.e. short-lived radionuclides with even lower concentration should be stored in plastic, if possible. Sometimes that's not possible, so there is a trick to reduce the cation exchange capacity of the glass for this radionuclide. Can we see it? 
These radionuclides are dissolved in acid. In an acidic medium, the silanol group of the glass dissociated much, much less and thus the ion exchange capacity decreases rapidly. So much for the reaction vessel. Now for the chemistry itself. Depending on the nucleide, the nucleides may be present in such low quantities that they not seem to adhere to thermodynamics due to the lack of interactions with other ions of their type. They are just too far away from each other. Then a carrier is added. Ideally, it's a stable isotope of the same type. As here, we have radioactive iodine. The carrier should be added as early as possible, before the radionuclide itself. But now there are different types of iodine, sodium iodide or sodium iodate, which should we use? Since the radionuclide is present as iodide ion in caustic soda, the stable sodium iodide should also be chosen. Iodate is pentavalent and therefore the chemistry is a bit too different. If it is not possible to add carrier of the same oxidation state, it must be oxidized or reduced later. And then you can do iodine chemistry with radioactive iodine. Often you want to precipitate the nuclide out of the solution later in the form of some precipitate. Like here with radium as a polysoluble sulfate by adding sulfuric acid. Unfortunately that didn't work. Because with an activity of 1 kilobecquerel the solubility product of radium sulfate has not been exceeded. Because there is no suitable carrier of the same element for radium 226, a chemical homologue must be used. Barium chloride was added here. We are now talking about non-isotopic carriers here. In the end, a mixed radium barium sulfide precipitate is obtained. This works very well, as can be seen from the spectrum. Why? Radium and barium are so similar that radium can sometimes take up places in the sulfide lattice on the behalf of barium. This is a so-called co-precipitation. The precipitated radionuclide does not always have to exchange places for the carrier element in the precipitate. In this case we have a non-isomorphic exchange that leads to an anomalous solid solution precipitate. Plutonium 4 plus for example can be precipitated out by using neodymium trifluoride. Although in this case plutonium 4 plus ions cannot exchange places for the neodymium 3 plus ions. Sometimes co-precipitation is not desired and a so-called holdback carrier is used. For example when radiobarium is precipitated out by lanthanum fluoride. The stable barium is added since barium fluoride does not actually precipitate in this way. And thanks to the stable barium this does not happen and the radiobarium stays in solution. There is also another type of precipitation called the scavenger precipitation. A precipitation in which the ion exchange effect is specifically used. What a nice context for this video. For example, trivalent iron is added to a solution and by adding ammonia solution, often present as ammonium hydroxide, iron trihydroxide is formed. Here too the hydroxide ions can dissociate from highly charged ions such as the iron 3 plus ion. And via the oxide ions can now pull other metal cations into the precipitate. And in this case it's now our radionuclides. The radionuclides are adsorbed onto the precipitate. This is not very specific but it's great if you have to decontaminate water for example. Alternatively the whole thing can also be done with manganese 2 plus which is isoelectronic to the iron 3 plus. And it also forms this manganese dioxide hydrate with ammonia solution. Same story but a bit unsuitable for wastewater due to the environmental problems that come with manganese 2 plus ions. That was a little overview of the beginnings when it comes to doing chemistry with radionuclides. Let's see what I come up with for part 2. A special thanks goes to the working group of analytics and fundamental nuclear chemistry from Dr. Erik Strupp and the division of nuclear chemistry at the University of Cologne and to my patrons. With that being said, thank you for your attention and goodbye.